copyright notice. You are free to download and copy this work in audio format for replay in any audio or video mode, and I encourage you to do so and enjoy and learn. You may redistribute it in a non-commercial fashion, that is, not for profit directly or indirectly. You may not sell or seek to profit from this publication in part or in whole, nor may you translate it into any written format for any purpose. Thank you. Chapter 13 of the e-novel, survival novel, The Walls Came Tumbling Down, as read by the author. Take down. Big Mike would hit the objective with one element in a single envelopment. This was the simplest way to take an objective. He was just as focused on avoiding a friendly fire incident as he was about being shot by the enemy or having one of his people shot by them. He had learned in Afghanistan to never make a plan too complicated. Because of that, tonight, they would go straight in and use their superiority in firepower and night vision, and most of all, their training. The Fallen had trained on these type tactics as a business move entirely. This was part of their profession. In the drug trade, it was all about turf, all about controlling an entire area. If you had a strong competitor, it not only drove prices down, they also cut into your customer base. Additionally, the constant struggling and dealing with new people and faces put them all at odds with the law, made their business too high profile, and made the cost too high and the gain too low. The solution was to not just take your opponents down, therefore, but to do it in such a way that you displayed a superiority in fighting and bringing a war. This way, nobody would consider going to war with you again. Even larger clubs, because the cost was not worth the reward, or more precisely, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. Years ago, the Fallen had gotten into a war with a motorcycle club, a rival over the meth trade for the region, and Big Mike had been a prospect during that time. The raid was poorly planned, and Mike said as much, for which he nearly got a beat down. Prospects didn't talk. They listened. They took orders without question and obeyed. Only Danny's intervention had prevented immediate club discipline, which could have been fatal considering what was involved. Danny had considered something in Big Mike early on, though, and let him say his piece. Mike explained that doing a frontal assault on the other club would turn into a bullet swap festival and they would lose at least as many as they took down. Danny listened and then told him to shut up and go with the warlord, Dusty. After this, though, they had a disaster and the warlord, Dusty, lost his life. So Danny listened to Mike. He explained that while he was in 5th Special Forces Group at Fort Bragg, he had noted that men who liked Harleys also were into shooting and tactical things and that it was easy to get such men to go to the range, to keep them motivated. He then went on to explain that the tactics used by most clubs were well below amateur level, that even the most ragtag gorillas he had ever trained could do better. Mike said that if they would train properly, the members would not only have a good time doing so, they would be light years ahead of the competition, that when they did go to war, it would be swift and decisive and therefore infrequent, allowing them to concentrate on business instead. Danny liked what he heard, and Big Mike had just gotten his patch, and his first assignment, as such, was to start training the Fallen for war. He had given a list to Danny of equipment and put on things he wished for but knew he would never get. Things like secure radios, night observation devices, crew serve weapons, silenced pistols, and full auto main battle rifles. Mike had underestimated Danny, though, who never did anything halfway. He got literally everything he asked for, which put a lot of pressure on him now to make it happen. There were no excuses. They had built a huge kill house out of tires stacked eight feet high and secured with large engineering stakes and cables to the ground in the shape of a house with many rooms. They would break the club members down into groups of six and then practice clearing these rooms moving through and shooting down all the targets, all with live ammunition, of course. There were a couple of training accidents, negligent shootings, which Danny didn't have a problem with, 
Besides, he said, that's what hospitals are for. A sort of rite of passage to show you trusted your brothers was to submit to sitting in a chair in one of the rooms while they cleared. You picked the room and sat silently while they moved through the building and shot up all the cardboard silhouette targets. You would sit in between several targets and when your brothers came in, they would shoot the targets around you and hopefully not you. You were allowed to wear earplugs, of course, and it seemed insane, but Mike knew the impact it would have. It built absolute trust, absolute loyalty, and absolute commitment to your team. You knew who you could count on, and you were saying, in essence, I trust you with my life, which were more than just words when you did this. Shooting was a part of club life. And just as much as a man was measured in part by his loyalty to the club, his courage in the face of danger and the machine he rode, his skill with weapons was an equal part of that. It was his identity. If for not for the meth trade, the focus and money put into this would have been impossible. Big Mike compared it to the Taliban and the opium trade. Neither organization used the drugs they profited from, and both were able to fund their operations from it. Now, all that training was going to come into play yet again. They had used it in the past to take down their competitors, who were frankly a bit more squared away in discipline than these people. Mike now listened on his headset as the two team leaders indicated they were in position. They were up. Making one final scan, he gave the command. Execute, execute, execute. Both elements had stacked on either side of the front door. They flowed through the targets starting at the same entry point. This prevented them from shooting each other in the chaos that always ensued. Anything with a pulse got shot. People and animals alike. No surrender, no prisoners. A very simple and direct mission. Big Mike flowed left behind Dirty. The other team, led by the dinger, only pushed into the living room and then held fast to avoid confusion. They would only be needed if the primary got pinned down. Dinger was a former ranger, and he knew this drill better than most men know how to take off their shoes. If they got pinned down, they would hammer them fast and hard. There was a lot of screaming and pandemonium, and many of these people tried to surrender, but were cut down immediately. There was a lot of screaming and pandemonium. And the fallen, though, had bulletproof vests and no mercy, and they wore helmets. Big Mike mused it was the only time you could make the brothers wear a helmet. Entering the back bedroom, a young girl's voice called out, Please help me! Looking around, Big Mike saw a hand reach up from under the bed, and the girl quickly crawled out and stood before him. Before he could even shoot her, he realized she was not part of this group. Dirty looked at Mike to see if he would shoot. She was wearing a pair of pajamas, and shooting her just seemed completely wrong, even to them. They were used to shooting down other men, the competition, not some little girl. Even with his PBS-14 on, he could see she had been beaten a lot. Please help me, she begged. He rolled his eyes and was glad this wasn't going to be his call. He would have to leave that up to Danny and was glad of it. Castle Keep. Standing in the turret with a light rain falling now, the ox looked through his binoculars at the old brick and mortar building. Sergeant Shamron had said it was built some time back around 1900, and it looked like a castle with a balcony that ran the perimeter of the building on the second floor. Each balcony cropped out significantly several feet at the corner and would be perfect for mounting crew serve weapons. Mitchell would be in charge of clearing and checking the building. Ox didn't like Sergeant Mitchell, but the rat-faced little man was a former ranger, and he did know his tactics. Because of this, Ox put him in charge of leading the mission to take the armory. The men operated like an efficient organization when there was work to be done. Ox was amused when he considered that even though his soldiers had all gone rogue with him, they still knew how to operate as a cohesive military unit, and had discipline at times. They had been observing the building for the past hour and had seen no sights of activity. Satisfied, Mitchell took two others with him and swiftly moved on foot up to the armory while the vehicles pulled into position. The drivers for the three vehicles from which Mitchell and his team had dismounted climbed into the turrets when they were in position. 
Mitchell had done this operation well, even using a sand table and had the soldiers doing rock drills followed by rehearsals and inspections. The ox hadn't participated in any of it though. It was too much work. Rank has its privileges after all. Ox also was learning that it comes with responsibilities. So many details to cover. So many things he had to think of. Life would be much harder now. Mitchell's team moved swiftly as it entered through a window on the side that was broken out already. The area outside was littered with debris and it was obvious many people had already been here. Hopefully none of them still. Ox had no doubt they could take on most comers, but still he didn't want to waste ammo and stand the chance of losing men. He didn't care about them as men, but only as workers, men to stand guard and keep him from having to do so. Soon Mitchell appeared at a second story window and gave the all clear sign. The vehicles were quickly pulled up to the building and the perimeter was established, leaving one man in the turret of each vehicle while the rest dismounted and went inside to have a look. The men meandered around the old place with its brick and concrete walls, buffed marble floors now covered in dust and mud. They were all looking for anything useful to them and realized quickly that they were too late for anything except broken furniture and debris. The building had been picked clean. There was nothing left of any use, and Ox had expected no more. While the men were poking around inside, though, Shamron and Ox went outside and located the diesel tank. There was every evidence that the diesel was gone as well, though. The covers of the tanks were off. Shamron fished around by the fence and found the measuring stick covered in weeds and snow. The tanks had no diesel in them, his stick confirmed, only several inches of water. Shamron then took the stick and led Ox behind the building. There was an innocuous looking pipe sticking out of the ground that looked sooty and was covered in dirt. The pipe had a bucket over the top and Ox would never have guessed that this was the oil fill pipe for the heating oil. The heating oil was the same thing as diesel, except there was a road tax on diesel, of course, or there used to be anyway. The tank was over three quarters full, which Shamron said represented about 1,500 gallons. Inside the building, the tool room had been looted and rifled, though, but Shamron knew there was an old hand pump for diesel, and he took it and fed the two-inch hose down inside this oil tank, set it up on top of the pipe, and pumped. After about 50 strokes, some oil came, and the ox smiled. The wrecking crew was back in business again. There was a large water cistern on the roof that they looked at next, a byproduct of its earlier days when the building was first constructed. That cistern had an old cast iron pipe running from it with a valve that looked like it must have rusted shut 50 years ago and was leaking water from a crack. It was disconnected but had filled with rainwater. They climbed up and looked inside and it appeared to be filled with blooms of nasty algae and plant life growing inside in huge clumps. It would definitely not be drinkable without purification, that much was certain. Inside the building, though, they located a 500-gallon water tank for the gymnasium showers and the locker room. It was still full. Ox laughed. Nobody thought to turn the hot water on when they needed a drink, apparently. Of course, there was no electricity and the city water uh, was the only thing nearby. Ox put Mitchell on the task of setting up guard mount. The men were broken down into teams of three, one on each corner of the building. Ox could sleep wherever and whenever he wanted. The crew served weapons were dismounted from the vehicles and Mitchell set them up on the balconies at each corner to cover the main avenues of approach. He even made range cards and designated specific on-call targets and explained to the teams that in the event of an alert, they would have to man their weapons and one man would always need to be near the weapon, but not necessarily awake. A single man would, however, rove the perimeter on the roof with nods and be fully armed at all times of the day and night. This would give the other men a chance to sleep, to rest, work, and conduct patrols and raids. Ox would need to recruit more men in order to defend the armory and also run these raids. For now, they would roll with three vehicles with three men per vehicle and leave four men behind at the armory. Of course, to recruit more men would also mean more mouths to feed, more water and other supplies. 
From what he had seen nearby, a lot of the farms had been burned out, though. He wondered who the competition was and what kind of fool was burning houses down and killing people instead of just coming back and tapping them, like shearing sheep or milking cows. He also cursed Phelps under his breath for making his life so hard now as he lumbered off to find a place to sleep. Taken. The tall blonde man appeared to be in charge. People kept coming to him and asking him questions. He ordered her to put on some warm clothes and then just stood there watching. She asked him if he would turn away, please, and he just laughed. But he did turn away a bit. Quickly, she pulled on pants and tucked her sleeping gown inside. She dressed hurriedly because he seemed impatient and she didn't want to make him mad. She realized by his demeanor that he was not a policeman and not a soldier. From somewhere in the house, a single shot rang out, followed by another. Who were these people, she wondered. What would they do to her? The man led her through the house. She saw the bodies of several of the hunters sprawled out in grotesque and unnatural forms, all of them shot in the face as well as several times in the body. She thought she would be ill, and he grabbed her by the arm and hurried her along. He was too rough, too dirty, too brusque, and even rude. Now she feared she had gone from bad to worse. Now she feared for her life. Would this man be worse than the one before? She thought of running away, but realized she would not get far. She would have to trust. Outside, he ordered on to the back of the snowmobile behind him. She got on, but did not sit too close to him. He took off with a jolt, and she nearly fell over the back. So she hung on to him tightly, but trembled as much from the cold as from the fear. She prayed and cried silently. Phoenix. A hard rain pelted the crowd of soldiers as they huddled to try and enter the post-movie theater. All personnel not on security duty were ordered to attend a mandatory briefing. The base had diesel generators, some of which were used to provide electricity for key services, like the pumping station for water. The base had its own water and waste treatment facilities as well as a hospital. The theater had been turned on for this morning only, but only for this meeting as well. Inside, soldiers shook water from their hair. The air system was not turned on, and soon the room began to smell of wet soldiers, many of whom had not bathed this morning either. Water rationing was in effect, and bathing was rationed out to every other day, or unless you had just come in back from a mission. The room soon filled with a noisy hubbub of conversation, and the din almost became a roar as everyone speculated on what they might hear today. Everyone, of course, knew the purpose of the meeting. The rumor mill had been in overdrive, and uh, since the basic reason was obvious, nearly everyone had already been counseled and signed papers to be furloughed or retained. Those retained would be paid, although there was no money. Instead, the finance section would be issuing script that could be used on post, although there was currently nothing for sale. Phelps had heard that the commanding general for the 10th had held an officer call and explained the situation briefly to select officers and key staff. But he had also scrubbed his list to ensure as many men with family could also go home. He knew from the personnel section which ones did have family in cities that were positively confirmed as being destroyed. These men were informed that they could leave, but that they may have nothing to go home to. The commander and his staff did everything in their power to take care of their soldiers. A hush fell over the crowd. Someone had seen the commanding general come inside, and the CG's sergeant major, a hardened old soldier wearing a 10th mountain patch on either shoulder, stepped into the pack the back of the room and called them to attention as the CG quickly strode in. At ease, soldiers, take your seats, he said in a friendly but businesslike fashion, bouncing up the podium stairs. The CG was typical of so many modern generals, having to be as adept a politician and diplomat as he was a warrior. The CG jumped straight to the point. Soldiers, the government has been operating in an emergency fashion since the collapse. He paused and scanned the room before proceeding. Unfortunately, the problem hit so fast and was so widespread that instead of controlling it, it controlled us. He emphasized the word us, and it was deliberate. The sec def has received instruction to furlough as many of the military as possible, and I was made aware of this two days ago. 
He paused to let this sink in. Concurrent with that, many of you have been counseled already and advised that you will be furloughed. Some will have to remain here, though. He made this latter seem like it was something of a sacrifice, which was not entirely true for those with family on post or who had family and knew that life here, uh, although Spartan, was vastly preferable to that on the outside. I've asked Colonel Henderson, my two, to give us a brief this morning. He stated while gesturing with his hand behind him to the colonel, a black man with a shaved head who stood a good half foot above the general. The two, or Division G2, was head of intelligence for the entire division. The general had concluded his part with, listen up, this brief will be of crucial importance to us all. The colonel stepped up to the podium and said, thank you, general. Slide. The screen behind the colonel lit up and there was a chuckle uh, that went out because everyone realized this presentation, like every other one before it, would also be in PowerPoint. Good Lord, PowerPoint would probably survive anything, Phelps thought. The colonel smiled and understood what the men were laughing at. Yes, men, PowerPoint is officially here to stay. He allowed himself a smile and then his face took on a concerned and almost pensive look. The briefing would be an information brief. He explained, which meant, in essence, none present needed to make a decision that had already been made for them. Each soldier would, however, need to make individual choices later. Beyond that, there was no way to assign everyone a single mission to cover this scenario. The intel section had been monitoring a variety of communications and some limited intelligence reports and put on a thorough and detailed presentation designed to advise all personnel of the situation they would be facing as they were furloughed shortly. It was not a pretty picture either. Many members heard for the first time what they had feared all along, that their families and homes were indeed gone now. Others were perhaps comforted to not hear any information at all, for at least no news from these areas might be held out as some hope against all odds. During the briefing, they learned that literally tens of millions of people had fled the cities and the urban areas when desperate, hungry, and angry people had turned to looting. This in turn led to rioting, which quickly erupted into full-scale violence. The military near some of these first cities to erupt had been sent in quickly to try and stop the mayhem, to protect lives and property, but they were so fast overwhelmed and overall were ineffective. Because of this, the SecDef had ordered all units to hold position and to not deploy troops into the area. It was a tough call, but the numbers were not there to do more than exacerbate the chaos. The rest of the federal government was equally powerless, if not more so. Even if there had been enough personnel, there was no reliable C2 or command and control to coordinate efforts, to organize some method to deal with the swarms of refugees that poured forth in desperation and panic. The remaining intelligence gathering assets that the government had still operating had been monitoring the situation throughout the world, feeding this information to the skeleton government still operating from an undisclosed emergency location. The President had signed the executive order to furlough as many military personnel, DOD civilians, and federal employees as possible. This same policy was being performed throughout all government agencies and bureaus, and even at state and county levels, those that still existed. At Fort Drum, nearly two-thirds of the military, as well as nearly all of the DOD civilians, were to be cut loose. Senior officers, critical military occupational specialties, or MOSs, and skills would, however, be retained. This RIF, or reduction in forces, would allow the remaining and dwindling resources to cover minimal operations for perhaps a year or longer. It seemed to be the worst time to do this in the face of such disaster, but the government was looking far ahead, looking to, the, to a day it would need to fulfill its role again. Many who had once feared the government realized now it was similar to the man behind the curtain on The Wizard of Oz. It could make great things appear to happen, and if it could concentrate efforts in a tiny area, it would seem immense and all-powerful. However, when it was proven to be incapable as today, it was nothing more than the man behind a curtain making smoke, flash, and mirrors, and that not effectively.
Many active duty personnel lived on post with their families, and these people had the safest existence so far. Although food was running critically low, which was the primary reason for the order to furlough as many as possible, life was still good and safe. Those who did remain would be organized to help conduct agricultural operations on the base, but more importantly, to provide some security to protect the local farms and others as they sought to rebuild the infrastructure. The heads of FEMA and other organizations, in fact, admitted that they had no contingency plans at all for this and had not even considered the possibility of such widespread calamity and disaster. Their only ability in the past to deal with problems was to concentrate their forces in the afflicted area and rely on the rest of the country to help lift that place up. The FEMA camps and other disaster relief resembled a squirt gun trying to put out a roaring inferno as a result. They were consumed in an instant in the face of the stampede of humanity that erupted from the cities. The collapse could not have come at a worse time. Winter was approaching and there was no place to go. Lacking any kind of plan, even remotely, many people had fled to the countryside only to find hardship, hunger, and deprivation. Often the engulfed entire small towns, especially those nearest the cities, and quickly turned to looting and burning. Colonel Henderson explained to the men that because of this, those who stayed would be working very hard, not just as soldiers, but also with the redevelopment of the local infrastructure, helping to guide it back to where it was. Referring with a gesture of his hand to a wiry lieutenant colonel to his rear, he said, our civil affairs team, led by Lieutenant Colonel Goss, will be briefing those of you that stay later more on this. The G4 then took the podium and explained the logistics piece to the men. Each soldier's destination address would be recorded, and they would be given an allotment of one gallon of gasoline for every 15 miles of travel to that destination, with the caveat that they were highly encouraged to ride with other soldiers for security purposes as well. Jerry cans, some of which were for water but would have to make do, would be available based on the gas allotment or fuel allotment a soldier received, minus 10 gallons, or for what would fit in the gas tank of their car. The G4 asked that the soldiers remember there was not an unlimited supply, and if they needed less, to take less. He also knew that nobody, nobody would short themselves on fuel and would take every drop they could. In addition to fuel, the soldiers would be allowed to draw one case of MREs each and a thousand rounds of ammunition for their rifle or 200 rounds for their pistol. Each would sign for and take home their assigned individual weapons, field gear, body armor, and certain sensitive items such as compasses, GPSs, binoculars, PBS-14s, and of course their uniforms and personal effects as much as their automobiles would hold. Anything left behind could be put into the company storage area per normal deployment procedures. The S-1 then took the podium and explained that each soldier would be required to record their destination with as much contact information as possible so that when the government did stand up, they would receive their back pay and other benefits earned. He then went on to explain a lot of forms and details that most people just tuned out and didn't seem to end his portion, but rather just sort of trailed off into minutia and irrelevancy. As if on cue, the general stepped up to the podium and thanked the S-1. He paused for a second and then took the microphone out and walked to the edge of the stage. The projectionist cut off the slideshow. Soldiers, he began gravely, you've seen the intel. This is the absolute latest we have, and it isn't good news. He seemed to think carefully for his next words. Throughout the course of human history, there have been widespread disasters, wars, invasions, and disease, and we have always managed to survive. We will survive. This nation will rebuild, he said forcefully. And there were several cheers of hua, but that was not what the general was going for. The strength of a nation, you see, is not in its government. It should never be, and maybe that is why we have our current problem. He continued, our strength is rather in its citizens, and those citizens are in families and little towns across this country. Those of you being sent home will be released from duty, but not from your oath. That last one stands for us for the rest of our lives. 
The power and sincerity in his voice was moving. The soldier sat in rapt attention now to his next words. As a soldier speaking to soldiers, I need you to go home now and serve your country by helping it rebuild, by starting with protecting your families and the communities around you from these marauders. One day, like the phoenix, we will rise, and on that day, when we stand, this army back on its feet, we will hopefully meet again right here in this very place. On that day, I hope to see you all here. The general's eyes teared up a bit, and then he abruptly said, Thank you, and walked off the podium. In the back, the command sergeant major called the theater to attention, and everyone snapped to as he left. A moment later, Colonel Henderson returned to the microphone and said, Soldiers, if you have any questions or need any other information, check with your chain of command and send them up an RFI or request for information. If we know, we will tell you. You are released to report back to your commanders at this time. Thank you. Dismissed. The rain had ceased outside and the sky was clear now, giving Phelps a sense of hope as he walked outside with the others who were already engaging in excited conversations and plans. Some of the younger soldiers seemed to view this as a sort of adventure, especially the ones who had no combat patch on their right sleeve. The older soldiers had a more grim, determined look on their face. Some looked even lost and in a panic. Phelps wondered what look was on his face as he double-timed back to the company area. The village. Leaving half the team behind to hold the objective, Mike led the other half back to the clubhouse with the girl on the back of his machine. Gunning it hard, flipping his PBS-14 over his eye, he zoomed into the night and the rest followed. Along the way, he called in that he had something he needed to show Danny so he would be ready. Danny didn't like surprises, and Mike understood and respected that. No leader ever did. Parking the machine in the barn, Mike ordered the girl off gruffly, took her by the arm, and said, Let's go. Now she began to tremble visibly and started to pull back a bit. He gripped her arm hard, and she winced before he gestured with his head. Head down, she walked toward the house in front of him. At the clubhouse, Danny was sitting at the kitchen table, and Mike came in, hurting the girl in front of him. The other club members were lounging in the front room, and some of them ogled her. One made a suggestive remark. Mike rolled his eyes and told the man to give it a rest. Raucous laughter followed, but nobody crossed Big Mike. Eyes wide, tears running down her face. She looked afraid now as she realized where she was, what kind of people she was in the hands of. She began to sob aloud as the realization hit her. Quiet girl, Mike said, and then to Danny. She was hiding in the farm. Somebody's been beating on her, too. I figured she was definitely not there on her own will. He kind of felt bad for her now when he said this, realizing she was just another of the millions of victims out there. He still felt kind of sorry for her, too. Pausing for a moment, fixing her with a hard gaze, Danny asked, What's your name, girl? My name is Rachel, sir, she replied in a trembling voice. Danny chuckled at being called sir. He hadn't been called that, well, actually forever. Sit down, Rachel, please, he motioned. Mike thought this was some kind of game. He had never seen Danny use manners or be so kind. He thought he was up to something. Without taking his eyes off the girl, he said, You can go, Mike. Thanks, and good job. Danny looked at the girl, and he remembered something now. He remembered a young Marine standing in the middle of a village in a little country on the far side of the world. He remembered a young girl in a village there who was not much different from this one. She had smiled at him one day, and he spoke to her in the few words of her language that he understood. She said hello to him in English, her voice sounding sweet like an angel. They had visited for a few minutes, shy, awkward, and even tense. He was nervous, partly from worrying what his squad leader would do if he caught him not paying attention to security. As they left, he noted the girl standing timidly, looking down at the ground. When she looked back up at him again, she stole his heart. The village was about 10 kilometers or clicks from their fire base, and their patrols would often pass through. The PRT, or Provincial Reconstruction Team Leader, would have them do basic hearts and minds work here, handing out candy to the kids and visiting with locals and sometimes supporting MedCap mission with corpsmen giving shots and performing minor checkups aided by an army physician. 
This was perfect for Danny, and because of the girl, he had taken a new interest in learning the language. He was smitten by this beautiful, innocent girl. He eagerly looked forward to the weekly patrol, though, through that village, and thought of this girl and nothing else. One day they came back to the village to find it had been burned down. The people had been shot and stacked up in a large pile as a warning to others not to cooperate with the Americans. He did not want to look in the pile, but he had to. There she was, not even looking like a human. He saw her, her beautiful face now bloated, hardly recognized, but it was her. The horror of that never left him, ever, and it made him bitter and angry. Now that girl was back. She was sitting in front of him, but he was an old man, no longer that once young Marine. He saw the fear in her eyes, too, and he made a decision. Crystal, he called to his woman, and she came. Get this girl something to eat, and make sure she has a good night's sleep. And then turning to the girl, looking her directly in the eye, he smiled a bit and said, alone and safe. In the morning, Danny took several members with him in escort, and they went someplace they hadn't been before, into the Amish country. The girl directed Danny up to the house, and the club members wanted to laugh as their leader taking directions from this little girl, but they knew better than to laugh. Nobody had a death wish like that. At the farm, a lone Amish man came out carrying a pump shotgun and was shocked to see Rachel. It was her uncle Caleb. Danny looked at the man with the shotgun. He lowered the weapon and put it in his left hand and smiled. The girl leapt off the machine and ran to her uncle. Danny sped away without a word or even a glance back, his men following close behind. Danny's mind was already consumed by another thought right now, a rumor that he had heard, but if true, it would spell the answer to their needs and a lot more. 